you know, building up educational aspects, building up opportunities for these young men who joined these gangs to lure them away from the gang lifestyle, that doesn't happen within a year or two. That's something that happens over 20, 30 years. Hey, this is Danny Gold uh, for Vice News. I'm a producer and correspondent, and I was just down in El Salvador in September. Uh, we were doing a documentary there about the, uh, the murder rate there, which has gone through the roof recently, and it's now the highest homicide rate in the world in a, peace in a peaceful country. Um, we looked at the gangs down there and the war between the gangs and each other and the gangs and the government, how the truce between them fell apart, why it fell apart, um, and sort of the overarching aspects of that. We talked to gang members, civilians, uh, police, people just really caught in the middle of it. Um, the, the documentary is up on vicenews.com right now. You can take a look at it, but I'm here to answer your questions right now on the line. Well, hey, Danny, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we got a bunch of people who are excited to talk to you on Skype, and let's just jump right in. Let's talk to Mikey. Sure, sounds good. Hey, Mikey, how are you, man? Good, man. How are you? Good. Hey, man, so first of all, just good job on the report. Like, it was a really interesting documentary. Um, and, like, having a Salvadoran background, I took a lot of interest in it. Um, so the first question I have is, like, with all the gang violence and, like, kidnappings going on in the country, was there ever, like, a fear for your life or, like, any close calls? Um, you know, not really. Uh, and that's because, you know, I have a certain privilege when I go down there. Being uh, a white Westerner and a reporter, um, I think gangs know. Look, I, that, that's happened before, but I think for the most part, gangs try to avoid that because they know there's going to be a lot of attention directed towards them um, when I'm down there, you know, if, if something happens to me. Uh, the concern really more is for the people that I'm working with, my fixers who, you know, they stay behind and I've got to be concerned for their safety because something that I do, something that we air could eventually get them in trouble. Uh, the concern is also for the people you talk to, the civilians especially, um, who, you know, the gangs down there don't have a high tolerance for anyone talking about them these days. And that's why we protect a lot of identities. So the concern is much more for them than it is for me. I'm also kind of an idiot, so, so the fear doesn't really hit me until it's too late. Uh, and, but when we went out with the police, you know, you never know what's going to happen in these neighborhoods. Um, for the most part, things were really safe, but, but when you're down there and they're running out of the cars and there was situations where police have been fired on recently and police have been targeted and killed a lot this year. So there is a little part of fear that kicks in right there. And I think we have actually a clip of us going through one of those neighborhoods right now. Can we, can we air that? What's the situation in this neighborhood here? So yeah, I mean, during those moments, there's a little bit of fear, but for the most part, the concern is much more for the people that, you know, the subjects that I'm talking to are sources and for the fixers that, um, that I'm leaving behind in the country. And then, so, like, my second question is, there's been a lot of, like, talk about La Sombra Negra or the Black Shadow. Um, and there's rumors that it could be the police and the military trying to target the gang members. Um, but it seems to be kind of like a, cra a gray zone on that. What's your opinion on that or your knowledge on that? So that was something we heard a lot about, but it wasn't anything that I could verify. Um, so uh, they're essentially a, a death squad that's rising up, uh, vigilante justice and going after gang members and executing them. I know El Faro had a blockbuster report on some extrajudicial killings of gang members, including some innocents who just got caught up in it. And there's a lot of talk of these death squads rising up. El Salvador does have a history, um, especially in the 80s, of these sort of death squads that rose up to kill off uh, guerrillas and people that were accused of helping these left-wing guerrillas. They were right-wing death squads back then. One of the guys we spoke to in the documentary, uh, who was missing two of um, his cousin and, and her daughter, he actually sort of implied that he was a member of one of these death squads and that they got trained by the US because the US did train them in the Civil War, and that if things kept going the way they did, he might have to start taking matters into his own hands. And the feeling that I get is that there's a, quite a few people that have those, that sort of experience that, that feel the same way right now. And you hear a lot of rumors about that. Um, I, I think according to a lot of people, these groups are slightly active. They're supposed to be, no one really knows whether they're official or not. My assumption is that they're not, but they could be made up of police, police uh, you know, military figures of that nature, probably people with a history of being involved in death squads in the past. And there's also these stories of these villages, I think, in the north that are former guerrilla villages that still have that sort of network. And uh, we were told some stories that I can't confirm, but it seems like they could be likely, which is that, you know, gang members sometimes would approach these, these villages. And these villages have stayed gang free. So a gang member might show up and they'd be warned to leave. And if they didn't leave, they would disappear because they still have that guerrilla network in place. So I think that, um, you know, that might be a new stage of the conflict that we see in the next year or two if things continue the way they are. Okay, okay. Kind of adding to that, 
Um, it seems like the government's plan is just to fight violence with violence right now. Um, do you think that will ever take a different path? Maybe, you know, start more programs for, like, the youth and old gang members that maybe want to get on the right track? Or what's your opinion on that? I mean, that's the hardest thing to, to really think about because it, it really is meeting violence with violence, and that has popular support. And the thing that uh, Pastor Vega spoke to me about um, in the documentary is that, look, that's going to win elections. You know, the short-term fighting violence with violence, and you can see that all over the world, that wins elections. The long-term investment in communities, um, you know, building up educational aspects, building up opportunities for these young men who join these gangs to lure them away from the gang lifestyle, that doesn't happen within a year or two. That's something that happens over 20, 30 years. And that is the real solution, but that's not a solution that's going to win elections right now. So it's, um, it's tough because, you know, the, the, the political calculus isn't there to provide these long-term investments and solutions that would actually lead, um, in my opinion, to a, a decrease in people joining gangs and a decrease in violence. Because uh, it, it does come down to poverty and lack of opportunity, I think. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the hope is that, that those conclusions will be reached, but I, I wouldn't bet on it right now. For sure. All right, well, that's everything. Thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Mikey, thanks for coming on, dude. So, Danny, we're getting some good uh, uh, questions on Twitter, uh, and we got another Michael. Uh, this is Michael Anthony Adams, who mm -hmm. wants to know, uh, with the frequency and quantity of homicides in El Salvador, do journalists there cover murders differently than they would in a place like the United States? I mean, that's, a, that's kind of an impossible question to answer, because uh, homicides are covered differently in different cities and different states. Um, like, the attention paid in Chicago now is different than the attention paid in New York. Uh, I covered um, the crime beat in New York for a while, and uh, I remember some of the old school guys telling us that like every murder used to get covered in New York. And this is when New York had you know, thousands of murders a year. Now it's down to a couple hundred, and these really aren't covered that much. Um, so it all depends. I think that you know, there is uh, a really dedicated core of journalists who take a lot of risk to cover these murders in El Salvador. Um, and they do. They do try to cover a lot of them, and there are journalists all over covering them. Uh, and I think they do a great job. You know, these local journalists really put themselves on the line. This is their country, and, and, and people know who they are. Gangs know who they are. Um, and, you know, they know where they live, and they still are out there doing it. Uh, a photographer we work with, Juan Carlos, is one of those guys, too, who really puts himself on the line. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to answer it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Well, I think that was a, a good answer, actually. So uh, I hope Michael's happy, and if he's not, he knows how to tweet at you. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and say hey to Juan, who's uh, also on Skype. Hey, Juan, how's it going, man? Good, how are you? Good, dude. Uh, so my question is more regional, because I know earlier in the year you were down in Costa Rica, and, and you saw a little bit of escalation in violence even there. So mm -hmm. my question is, now that you've been there in both places, do you have any idea of what, what's escalating that violence? Mainly, like, is the drug trade, for instance, one of those that could be affecting it? Um, in Costa Rica, it's the drug trade. Uh, gauging that in El Salvador... Um, and I guess Honduras and Guatemala is a little out of my league. I mean, I went down there, we went down there, I heard different theories that, you know, the cartels had stayed out of El Salvador because the, the, the gangs down there had so many soldiers. I also heard theories that the cartels were working with the gangs to traffic drugs. I mean, the drug trade exacerbates it 100%. Um, how big a role it plays in everything else, I, you know, I, I don't know. But uh, it's definitely a huge regional problem. I mean, the Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, and, and El Salvador is the most violent region in the world, excluding countries that are at war. Um, you know, you had a lot of destabilizing factors in the 70s and 80s with the Cold War, of which the U.S. played a major role. You have a lot of weapons. You have a lot of countries that have weak state institutions. Um, you have a lot of poverty. And all those things, I think, play a role in, uh, in creating this sort of whirlwind of violence. I don't know if that's... My, no, that's a good, good answer. My yeah. second question is more only about, like, for instance, my personal experience, I haven't been back for numerous reasons on top of the, the, the violence. You know, the last time I was there, I got stopped. You know, they, they lift my shirt up. They're looking Jesus. for tattoos. Really? They're pulling out my pants, you know. So my thing is, you know, a lot of it reminds me of sort of the search and frisk we, see, we saw in New York. I wondered, wondered if you had seen any of that experience and, you know, if you had any experience with that. Yeah, I mean, when we were with, when we were with the, uh, the Los Alcones, they went and did that to two guys that they said were definitely gang members. Um... And I think they definitely do that a lot more, actually, than they did in New York, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, we heard stories of police harassment, police, uh, you know, beating up kids in any poor neighborhood. That's, that's one of the sort of negative 
uh, aspects of, of trying to beat these gangs. The police assume anyone in a poor neighborhood is a gang member. And what that does right. is that breeds more hatred and that pushes people that might not be gang members towards the gangs. So I think there's a lot of that going on um, with the police. They even, uh, Giuliani was brought in, I think, uh, earlier this year to talk to business leaders and, 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 and some political elites in El Salvador. I heard that was more of a political play than anything else. But um, that's sort of the, the, the mentality that the police there are going with. It's this really aggressive approach in policing. Uh, and that generally doesn't seem to work. Um, but I think a lot of people feel that they're out of options, that there's no other way to do it. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, stop and first, that is definitely there. And it's not, I think the human rights groups in El Salvador are a lot more silenced than rights groups were here in terms of uh, combating stop and frisk and raising attention to the negative aspects of it and how it was being misused. Right. I mean, for me, you know, I haven't gotten a tattoo because of that reason. You know, I go and see my grandmother, she's like, don't get a tattoo because you can go to jail. <laughs> they, told, they told me, they were, I mean, this is for going into gang neighborhoods too, but they were like, make sure you cover up all your tattoos when you go into these neighborhoods. Um, that was more for gangs, but also for the police as well. You know, they don't want to, that, that's really how it goes down there. But um, yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about your experience there being a Salvadorian. I'm glad that, that as a Salvadorian, you actually like the film because uh, that, that means a lot to us when, when people from the country that we're covering as outsiders uh, actually respect the work that we do. Yeah, great. And then my last one is sort of a behind the scenes thing. I know you were there for a few days. Did you get to experience any of the food? beverages. Oh, yeah. Food. Of course, dude. I mean, I, I wish I could have experienced more of, of the nightlife and more traveling because I've heard beaches down there are beautiful. Um, the country itself is beautiful. I ate a lot of pupusas. I probably gained like seven or eight pounds in 10 days. Um, and like some of the, what are they? I forgot the names, but all those like rotisserie chicken restaurants. Delicious. Like that's my favorite thing in the world. Um, so yeah, I hope things, uh, things calm down there and I can go back down there again and, and really enjoy myself and not do any work. Thanks, Danny. I appreciate it. Yeah, take care. Juan, thanks for coming on, man. So, Danny, we got a, a question on Twitter from Byron, um, and he wants to know, do you think that legalizing drugs in the U.S. Uh, might impact gangs in El Salvador? Yeah, I think they, they will. I think that the negative aspects of legalizing drugs, in general, across the spectrum of the drug war, the negative, I mean, it has such a negative impact on so many countries and so many people around the world. Um, I don't think there's any way legalizing it could have as big a negative effect as, as it does globally right now. Like, there's no question in my mind that, that it would decrease violence, it would decrease money to these organizations. Um, it's not a cure-all. Obviously, things are still gonna be, there's still gonna be poverty, there's still gonna be pain, there's still gonna be murdering, there's still gonna be organized crime groups. But I don't think anyone who could spend any time in these countries, anywhere in any inner city in America that's really been affected by the drug war could make, uh, even, even a halfway decent argument that we should keep fighting this drug war and we should keep um, all these drugs illegal. I mean, look, I don't have the answers to this. I don't know how the program would work, but the drug war has such a devastating impact globally on so many communities and so many countries, so many people that um, it, it's not working and, and we should be looking at, at any other option on the table and legalizing drugs is one of those options. Well, uh, that's a great policy position. So uh, I'll leave that for you to, to argue somewhere else. But uh, in the meantime, let's say hi to Ricky, uh, who has some other questions for you about El Salvador. So, sure. Ricky, you there? What's up, Danny? How you doing, man? Hey, Ricky. What's up, dude? Appreciate your work, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. So my, my question is, um, in just um, ethnic tourism alone, um, I think that could help uh, the economy a lot. Why, why do you think the government doesn't uh, go back in, in, into truce mode to try to curb some of the violence so some of the ethnics uh, would feel a little bit safer in going back and helping the economy with our, with our travel? Um, I, think it's a, I, I think it's a political situation where they know that the, the, the majority of people want them to go to war against the gangs. They don't want a truce. They want, um, you know, they, they want to fight. There's a lot of angry people out there with good reasoning. You know, everyone has, every, almost everyone we spoke to down there had suffered at the hands of the gangs. Whether it was them personally, their friends, they've all, a lot of people have lost loved ones, and that creates a real bloodlust, and that is what, you know, popular opinion, these polls show that, that um, people want war against the gangs. And that's how you win an election. And that's a political calculus. Uh, this is according to a lot of Pastor Vega, um, Jose San Luis, who, you know, these guys both know way more than I ever will. This was their, their interpretation of why this is happening, is they want, they want war against the gangs. I don't know if there's outside pressure as well from the U.S. or, or any other state actor, but um, 
I think it's all a political calculus. I think also maybe they're just fed up and they think there's no other way to do it. But like I said, I think the real solution is long-term investment, long-term help in these communities. That's not how you win elections. And that, that's a gradual process. There's, everyone wants an instant answer and there's no instant answer. Good, good, you gotcha, man. My next question is, um, with the government, uh, the El Salvador government labeling uh, the gangs as a terrorist organization, do you see um, any help from any foreign actors coming in and, and maybe helping with the situation? Um, I don't think getting directly involved. You know, I think that throwing the terrorist thing out there does definitely create a, an excuse for um, maybe policing practices that are a lot more aggressive. Uh, it creates a mind, and this is what Jose San Luis says in our, in our um, definitely says that in our, uh, in, in our, in our piece, that uh, that creates the mindset that it's okay to do this to gangs, that it's okay to round up innocents, that it's okay to, to go into these neighborhoods and behave a certain way that, uh, that you wouldn't if you didn't have that title. It justifies it. And it, and it empowers people to, to empower the government to, to do these sort of things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. It also gives them leeway in terms of locking people up. You know, it, 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 and it, it creates a, uh, a charge that you can just throw out there to lock someone up um, for, for an extended period of time. But I think it's more about the mindset that goes into this word terrorism and what it means and what you're allowed to do to people that you classify as terrorists or, or likely terrorists. Yeah. Well, yeah, man, I definitely like your answer about the, the long-term investment in, in, in youth and, and and just programs for the poor, I think would definitely curb, man. But yeah, man, thanks, Danny. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, of course. Thanks. I really appreciate you, you watching it and enjoying our piece. Thank you. Let's actually, um, let's go to a clip of, uh, of, I think it's C3 of Santiago talking about the gang's relationship with the government, because I thought that was really good. Can we do that? ¿Qué sucede? El partido actual, el partido que representaba al pobre, que ahora es el partido oficial de gobierno, el pobre sigue siendo pobre. Y el único aparato existente en este país con la facultad geográfica dispersa en todos los municipios de El Salvador, con un, una fluidez de votantes de 400 mil personas aproximadamente, eh, y con un poder para movilizar a esas personas, somos nosotros. ¿Me entiendes? Entonces, esos temores son los que tienen. So, um, Santiago was an extremely interesting person to interview. He was by far one of the most eloquent um, organized crime figures I've ever dealt with. Uh, but you could kind of see if you watch the entire interview, the way he went back and forth, there was a lot of, uh, a lack of personal responsibility there. Um, and a lot of things he said make sense in terms of the background and the situations that were created, but it's sort of like he's basically saying, look, I'm not responsible for the violence that, that my gang is inflicting. You know, this, was, this is our situation, this is the only way we could respond, which obviously isn't the case. Um, but the way that he rationalizes the gang's behavior and his behavior in his mind, I think is, is pretty fascinating. Cool, man. Uh, that was an important little bit of the documentary, actually. Um, so Dan, uh, almost at the end of the show, but we got two tweets that I want you to take a look at. Cool, uh, so let's, let's do these it. Are, the first one's from Daniel, uh, and Daniel wants to know, how did you see Salvadorian society overall while you were there? And then Edgar has a, a very similar tweet. Uh, with the country losing its youth to violence like El Salvador is, do you see change in El Salvador actually happening, or do you think that El Salvador is on the way to becoming a failed state? All right, one, uh, one at a time. Um, you know, I, uh, it's hard for me to gauge Salvadoran society because I went down there with the express purpose of, of going to some of the worst areas of that society and some of the worst, covering some of the worst aspects of that society. Um, you know, it's akin to someone coming to New York uh, in the 80s and like only spending time in the South Bronx. So I can't really pass judgment on, on it and what I saw. Um, I will say that from people I spoke to, there seemed to be a lot of fear right now. There's a lot of pride though too. And I think, um, you know, you can see it in the Salvadoran immigrant population that came here after the Civil War. Uh, it's, their Salvadoran society is extremely resilient. They've, they've been through so much over the past 100 years and they're bouncing back. And, uh, and, and it's, a challenging, it's a challenging society to sort of try to understand, especially only in 10 days. So I don't feel uh, right really commenting on that. I will say that from the people I was around, uh, I was welcomed very warmly. Um, and people were, were very happy that we were there. But at the same time, there's so much fear in Salvadoran society right now that it's, uh, it's very concerning. All right, well, I hope that answers your question, guys. And, I don't but, think it did, but anyway. <laughs> well, uh, I hope they're happy. Anyway, Dan, I think... Uh, Is anyone really ever truly happy? 
You know, Dan, I think the answer is yes, and that is small children on Christmas. And uh, with that, let's uh, <laughs> have our last, uh, our last uh, goodbye before the Christmas break. Wait, I, I thought there was another question. No, that was it. That's it? That's all? Yeah, that's all. All right, cool. Um, thank you guys for, for tuning in. The documentary is up on vicenews.com, Gangs of El Salvador. It's also on YouTube. Uh, we should be putting an extra scene up today where we spoke to some students and a representative for, uh, for USAID about the situation there and what people are trying to do. Um, to combat the influence of gangs on, uh, on, on the youth of El Salvador. Um, I think, are we on break next week? Is anyone doing, we're on break, right? It's Christmas? Yeah, we're going to go have some Christmas time. Okay, great. So uh, enjoy yourselves uh, over Christmas break. I think we'll be back in the new year with more on the lines. Um, and please continue to tweet at us. If you have any more questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Also, if you have an opinion on whether or not I should get a haircut, please also tweet at me and let me know because I, I don't know what to do right now. We're invited to see another grave, the aftermath of another killing. This one, the grave of a police officer murdered by the gangs. Her relative we met earlier wants us to see where she's buried. Marero que está la sepultada hace como un mes a la pardella. No he podido mandarle hacer la lápida. This is your relative right here, a police officer who was killed by a gang member, and right here is a gang member. Ya la viste la diferencia, alguien que quedó en el olvido y alguien que se le tomaron más importancia. Eso es. Solo el monte quedó y una cruz para que no se olvide dónde está.